he's a, a, a terrific person, um, terrific person. He's just a little kid, man. He always wanted to bet me if, uh, you know, he could make a shot with a water bottle from across the room. And I'm like, you know, I'm 28 at the time and he's like 22. And he's like, hey, Beck, 100 bucks. I'm like, 100 bucks, what? He's like, 100 bucks, I can make this. And I'm like, okay, you know, like, I, I don't know. Like, and then, you know, of course he drains it. You know, and you're like, of course, you're Mike Trout. It's like Derek Jeter. You know, of course he, you know, walks off on his last game. What's going on, everybody? Before we start this interview, I want to give a quick shout out to Hide It Mounts that made these beautiful mounts for both the PS5 and Nintendo Switch. I just received both of mine today and you know they're very easy to set up the instructions are very clear and you know you can show off the sleek look of the new ps5 in your gating setup on your wall stay tuned for more and enjoy the interview what's going on everybody welcome back to outside the stadium with us today is former chicago white Sox second baseman gordon beckham what's going on gordon not much guys thanks for having me uh, excited to be here. Of course, man. I'm Harry. d is the one with the Chicago White Sox background. What's going on, d -Row? What's going on, guys? d you want to take us away? Sounds good. So, Gordon, as most people know on the show, I like to turn the clock back. Uh, you were an extremely high prospect. You know, can you talk about what it was like being drafted eighth overall by the White Sox? Yeah, I mean, uh, amazing experience. It feels like a long time ago now, but uh, yeah, I think that going to college, I, I wasn't drafted out of high school. So it was one of those things where uh, I was just trying to get better. I played two sports in, in high school and, and was a pretty good football player uh, and never really focused on baseball besides the summers. And I mean, we played all summer. I was one, one of those kids that as soon as baseball started, it didn't end until I went to football practice. So um, it got better at Georgia. Uh, I think before the year, I mean, some people had projected me my junior year some people have projected me probably uh, uh, a, like a sandwich pick or something like that after the first round before the second um, at best. I think that was where I was projected. And I'll never forget, I had a, a conversation with the White Sox scout at the time. And he said, hey, uh, in, on like recruiting day or whatever, when those scouts come through and talk to the players and stuff, he goes, hey, we've got uh, the eighth pick overall and then the 96 pick. And we're probably not going to see you it at either or we're not going to take you at the eighth. And, you know, you'll probably be gone by the 96. So we don't really have to have a conversation. So we didn't. Um, and I was like, okay. Literally, it was like like 30 seconds conversation, and I was out of the room. So I was kind of like – it always kind of like bugged me a little bit, uh, just my personality. And so, I mean, little, little did I know I was going to have a huge year, and uh, they picked me eighth overall. And, I mean, just to get drafted in the first round is great uh, to uh, – to do it playing for my home home state and University of Georgia was awesome. Um, just a just a lot of fun. Just that that whole time frame from when I got drafted, but also like that year playing for the University of Georgia. And then fast forward one year later, I'm in the big leagues. It was just a, a whirlwind type of uh, a year. It was pretty, pretty crazy. Yeah, I don't, I don't think you can ask for a better year than that. You know, you're playing for your hometown and, and the Chicago White Sox the next year, first rounder. I mean, that's awesome. Man. Yeah. No, it was. It, it, it ended up working out really well, and I uh, was able to get up there quick, which was great. Yeah, for sure. So right before this interview, actually, I watched some of your highlights, and you hit two walk-offs back in 2015, with one of them coming off the hardest throw in MLB, Chapman. I love, I love that little celebration. You, you want to just talk about you know, that moment? Sure, yeah. Uh, so 2015, I had re-signed with the White Sox as a free agent. Uh, they had traded me the Angels the year before. So I was coming back uh, – with them I was hitting pretty good started the season pretty good and I'm facing Chapman and I I looked I felt at it back kind of felt like I was a little leaguer playing in like a like a big league game because with with him on the mound it, he's a scary guy like he's a scary at bat uh, I don't care if you're righty lefty or whatever uh, I did not I, I was not thrilled to have that at bat got down two strikes and I literally I think I had choked up like this much and I'm just like you know Pee Wee Herman up there like okay just touch the ball and I was able to bloop it into right center and we had uh made some fun of Adam Eaton um recently about he he had basically hush Josie sorry my my dog um we he had basically said uh that he was the straw that serves the drink and so we were giving him a hard time about that and 
next thing you know, it started to become a thing, like stir the drink, you know, be the straw. And so, you know, of course it happened on that day. It was Mother's, Mother's Day, I believe. And then I, so I, uh, I got, I stirred it up. You know, we did that. I'm actually, this is a kind of a funny thing is I, I actually am the only person in big league history, I think, to have a walk off on both Mother's Day and Father's Day of the same year. So the second, uh, the second time you're talking about, we were pl- facing the Rangers and I uh, hit a 68 mile per hour change off of, uh, um, off of Claudio, just barely over the fence in left field. It was like a, it was one of the weakest home runs I think I've ever hit, but it went over the fence and it was my only, uh, you know, walk off home run in my career. So that was a crazy year. Uh, that was a cool, like little, like side note that somebody was like, you know, you're the first person in history to do that. And I'm like, all right, well, I'll be remembered for something then. Um, that was about it, but that's okay. There, there are a lot of stats in baseball. That's a pretty cool one. Yeah, it's you know, interesting, that. right? So, so you're from Atlanta, and I feel like you know everyone wants to play for you know for their home team, and you actually got to play for the Braves for a bit. So, what was it like, kind of coming home and, and being in front of those fans and playing playing for the Braves? Yeah, so I, I obviously grew up watching Chipper Jones, Andrew Jones. Uh, ended up playing with Andrew later, you know, in his career, but. Um, grew up watching those guys, Maddox, Glavin, all those studs that came through Atlanta. And um, I think that when I when I signed there, obviously it was home. I was living there. But just to put on that uniform for the first time was just a really cool thing. I, it's, it's definitely my favorite uniform in the big leagues. I think it's just uh, – I think it's a really special uniform, the way it looks, all, all kinds of stuff like that. Like, I just felt like a lot of pride. Like, uh, yeah, the tomahawk chop and, and whatnot. Um, I felt a lot of pride, like putting that on every day. We weren't very good. We, you know, we were in a rebuilding year and, um, I, I, I had popped my hamstring twice, which sucked. Um, you know, but I was playing good at the all-star break when I was in there, I was hitting over 300 and, um, it was just, I had gotten back the second time from popping my hamstring right before the all-star break to play the White Sox and ended up having a good series and hit a home run against my old team, which was uh, satisfying, I guess. And uh, yeah, I, I, after that, I, I started to struggle, you know, for about a month, you know, coming back from that second entry, I just didn't have the feel for it. You know, I wasn't consistent and, you know, Dansby Swanson gets called up and, and that was kind of the end of my time there and um, was traded to the San Francisco Giants with five days left to go in the year which now they have a, uh, a rule that you can't do that. It was, you know, that I, I don't know what rule it's called, but they, they don't do allow trades that late now. Um, so I ended up going from the last place, basically the last place team in the NL East to the first or first or second place team in the NL West. And we won five out of six games and went to the playoffs. And I'm celebrating with the team that I had been there with five days, like been with for five days. And thank God, Buster Posey is one of my best friends and we were, you know, he was, he was there to kind of, you know, shelter me a little bit, but it was just like, it was just crazy. I went from last place to first place to celebrating on a field that, with the team that I'd been there for five days with. It, it was, it was nuts. That was a nuts, nuts trade. That is pretty crazy. I mean, not many people can have that, you know, from the bottom to the top and a good team, San Francisco too. It was pretty awesome. Oh, it was awesome. Yeah, it was awesome. And a funny story, my back went out, the second, because I, 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 my season was over. I was home with the Braves. We were going to play the last uh, couple games at Turner Field, and I was done, right, for the season. And then all of a sudden, I flew out there, and there's, you know, my back went out the second day I was out there, and I'm having to take these painkillers and make sure I can get on the field. And, like, I almost had to pull myself from the game, that one of the games I was starting, because I was like, I cannot run. I was literally running with my abs clenched. And that's the only way that I could, like, you know, like, grandpa run it like uh, out without it like killing my back and then I took a pill and in the first inning I'm diving around at third base making plays so um that was uh yeah it's a crazy experience that's great I'll pink at the power pink that. <laughs> hey I'm not I'm not I'm not saying uh that drugs are a good thing but I am saying that they work uh and that I could not have played I could not have played without it absolutely so you've just talked about, you know, your playoff experience with the San Francisco Giants. You want to talk about your playoff experience back in 2014 on the Angels? Yeah, um, it was fun. Uh, got traded over there. Uh, I think it was like August 18th or something like that, kind of in the middle of August. 
And at the time we were in second place to Oakland. And then I, I mean, I am definitely not the guy that made all this happen. Uh, there's, there's a guy that plays out there. You might know him. His name's Mike Trout. Um, but uh, when I got there, we were in second place and we just went on a tear. I think we, we were two or three games behind them in the middle of August and we clinched on like the 16th or 17th of September. And which means like, we just, we just caught fire. So that was awesome to be on a great team. And we just showed up to the field and like, we knew we were going to, you know, whip some tail that day. It was just one of those things that like it, you just felt it. I mean, it was just a really good team. I mean, being on teams like that, that makes baseball fun. And unfortunately for me, I played on a lot of teams that were having to kind of grind it out. And, um, you know, it's not always that, that enjoyable when, when you're having to grind it out all the time. Absolutely. Yeah. We, we, we've heard that from a bunch of guys, so it makes sense, but like, it's nice being traded from a last place team to a first place team. I'll, I'll never get over that one. That's very cool. Yeah. That's, that's a crazy story. And I mean, now I don't think that they allow it, you know, I mean, they, cause yeah. it was just so late and so ridiculous. Like the Braves were just trying to get like some sort of prospect for me and, I can't imagine they got much. I mean, you know, <laughs> I, I appreciate their uh, their hope that they could get something back, but um, I don't know if they got much back. For sure. So you just mentioned Trout, and I was going to ask about him, but I'll ask about some other, you know, amazing players that you, you've had the privilege to play with, like guys like Jim Tomey and Pujols and Trout. You know, I love hearing stories about, you know, some of the best we've ever seen. Any, any Anything to talk about, you know, those guys, any stories or anything you witnessed from them that are just, like, cool? Yeah, I mean, Jim Tomey is one of the best – ever you know you you meet a lot of hall of fame guys and a lot of them have big egos and are, are very into themselves and rightly so for in, in some regard but jim doesn't carry himself like that he's a he's a student of the game still he loves baseball he's like a little kid um and one thing he bought me my first suit um which i think is a really cool thing and not a lot of guys do that anymore so that was a really cool uh experience to have him help me get a suit when i got called up and then uh, another thing is we were flying to Minnesota and I will never forget we're in the dugout and he comes out of the tunnel and he just starts skipping around like all like giddy. I mean, like literally like a little five-year-old schoolboy, you know, and I'm like, what is going on? This guy's 40 years old and one of the best of all time. And he's like so happy. And he starts singing this song. He's like, because we were going to a Japanese hibachi restaurant in Minneapolis that he loves and so he was just like starting to sing about the yum yum sauce he's going to have tonight. And literally, you know, next thing you know, we're flying to Minneapolis and Jim Tomey's picking up a meal for like eight or nine people with hibachi grill and he's eating yum yum sauce. But like, I've ne he's like a little kid, man. He was, he's an incredible person. I mean, he's a better person than he is player, which is pretty scary. Mike Trout, um, I, I feel the same way about Mike. I think he's, I, I think he's an amazing person. He's uh, uh, we connected cause we both like to hunt. We like to deer hunt a lot. And uh, so we connected that way. And he, he's an amazing person because he's the best player I think that's ever played the game. I mean, obviously, you know, there's a lot of older players that I have never played with, but in terms of the guys that I've played with, he is by far the best I've ever played with and is not even close. I mean, he's on a different level. I mean, and he's a, a, a terrific person, um, terrific person. He's just a little kid, man. He always wanted to bet me if, uh, you know, he could make a shot with a water bottle from across the room. And I'm like, you know, I'm 28 at the time and he's like 22. And he's like, hey, Beck, 100 bucks. I'm like, 100 bucks, what? He's like, 100 bucks, I can make this. And I'm like, okay, you know, like, I, I don't know. Like, and then, you know, of course he drains it. You know, and you're like, of course, you're Mike Trout. It's like Derek Jeter. You know, of course he you know, walks off on his last game. Give me a break. Like these guys are just, it's like a fairy tale. Um, but he's, he's a great guy. Stud Pujols was, was a little quieter, but also a really nice guy, a very accommodating to me. And like, um, you know, I, I really love my time in LA. Uh, biggest mistake in my career was I had an offer from LA and I wanted to take it at the time. And, and I wanted to be with LA in 2015 but so we offered some, they offered something, we offered something, we figured we'd meet in the middle and they just never called back. And it was just one of those crazy moments that I think it really changed my career. If I had been hitting every day in that lineup in 2015, I think I really would have, I mean, you know, would have, could have, should have, but I really think that I felt at home out there and it would have been a great experience for me. 
Yeah, for sure. And I was going to say, I learned one another thing from this. Don't play Mike Trout in water basketball. <laughs> yeah. Don't. I, another thing, I think I think he probably spent a good twelve to fifteen thousand dollars on uh, what's the game you make the it, it was so so big uh, you make the little like uh, village in world uh, world of world of war. Is it a video uh, video game video. or what? No, it was on your phone. It was a mobile game, Clash of the Clans, Clash of Clans. There you go, bro. I th- I think I think he literally spent twelve to fifteen thousand dollars in a week in his fortress was 100 percent within a week and it was just like <laughs> man you must know where you're where you're heading in terms of this contract or maybe you just signed it i don't know but i mean he was just he's but he's a stud man he's you know he's he's just a great person too i i really like i wouldn't say that if if, if he wasn't he's a fantastic person he sounds like the most competitive guy i've ever met he's competitive beating the clash of Clans. yes yeah. yeah he's super competitive so I got to ask, uh, you know, you've mentioned your bobbleheads before the interview, but just show us a little bit of your bobbleheads and any, you know, talk about any jersey swaps you made also or any memorabilia you collected throughout your years. Yeah, so I, I, I've got a decent bobblehead collection. Not great, but it's it's probably about 20, 25 strong. So I brought these guys out. I got Bobby Cox uh, up front here, um, local legend. We got Mr. Harold Baines, uh, Chicago White Sox legend. Um, I, love, I love this bobblehead. That's great. And then we got Mike McCready over here. When I played for the Mariners, he would come out and, you know, uh, do the national anthem, you know, Pearl Jam guy. And I feel like I saw him play the national national anthem like three times. I feel like every time we were there with the White Sox, we saw him play. And then I saw him one time when I was actually uh, with the Mariners. So, I mean, Pearl Jam, man, I can't, you know, you can't can't go against those guys. It's pretty amazing. So those are the guys I'm going to keep out uh, today. Maybe next time I'll go grab some more. Um, and then, uh, sorry, Jersey swaps. I've got, uh, I didn't swap any, nobody asked for mine, um, but I asked for theirs. And uh, I got, you know, I got Derek Jeter, I got Mariano Rivera, I got Trout. Um, I, I asked them all to personalize it to me because I didn't, I, you know, I have no desire to sell it. Um, uh, I've got, I'm trying to think who else, I've got an Ichiro bat, Felix Hernandez, she, uh, cleats. Um, I know I've I got more. I've got Adrian Beltre. Um, I've got Andrew Jones, Jim Tomey, uh, Paul Canerco. I, I've got a good set, man. The dream. If I, yeah. <laughs> if I, if I had, uh, yeah. I mean, if I want to spend some money and frame them here soon, then I would have a good little man cave for sure. Yeah. That, that that's, that's wild. I'm the memorabilia guy on, on the show. And, and that is, uh, that is, See, I was always like jealous, like all these guys are swapping jerseys. Meanwhile, like it's so for fans, we really appreciate when guys, you know, care and will sign some autographs after a game. It's just, it's just cool. Sure. Uh, it's tough because it's tough because there's just so many people that are trying to exploit that. And, yeah. you know, I know some people want to do it because they love it and they love getting it. But a lot of these guys are just not great guys. They're like reaching over kids to get this. And, yeah. that, you know, that's what is really that's what turns the the players off, uh, you know, about that stuff. But I think for the majority of it, if for people that want it, you know, guys are pretty willing to sign. Yeah, for sure. And I was going to say Bobby Cox is one of my favorite people, like literally ever. He was a legend and Harold Baines is a deserving hall of famer. So I, it's a good collection over there. Yeah. Yeah, man. He's, I think, yeah, he, he got in recently, so that's good. Yeah. Um, yeah. but, um, uh, it's actually interesting. Uh, Mike Trout, you know, everybody talks about his rookie card or his prospect card. Yeah. Well, do you know who's still on the cover of the packages? I don't. I am. Really? And my grandmother bought me 11 of these hobby packs. And I've got them, like, I guess, because somebody told me. I was about to, like, literally give these things away. And somebody was like, you know, those are, like, worth a lot of money. And I'm like, what do you mean? And, they, I mean, I looked it up. They're the the hobby packs that I'm on the front of is my has a chance to have Mike Trout's prospect card, which is the one that he's all, you know, that went for like three million dollars. I think that was a one of one or whatever. So I don't think that could happen. But um, yeah, I've got an that's opportunity sick. to pull pull one of my good friends' cards. Yeah, that that's wild. I, I don't know if I'll prob- ever do it. Probably the unopened packs that are worth a ton, you know, a ton of money. People, the, yeah, the I card think, market's yeah. crazy. Yeah, it is crazy right now. I've had people tell me that I should keep it. I've had people tell me that I should sell it. 
and all kinds of stuff. I've also thought about doing it for charity. So I, I've got some thoughts and, and how we're going to do something, but I'm going to probably sit on them for a little bit. What would you do? I would sit on personally. My, yeah, I mean, it's Mike, it's Mike yeah. Trout. Yeah. It, well, I don't know. I just feel like things keep Mike crazy story real quick. My dad, like when Yu-Gi-Oh first came out, my dad, like someone told my dad to just buy a first edition pack. So we bought it. And I saw that first edition Pokemon packs were selling for like 400 grand. So I, I'm like, my dad, like, you know, check out how much this is worth. It was worth like 40,000, like $30,000 or something. It's like, yeah, he, he just threw it in the back of his closet. Like, I, you know, that'll give you the bug though. I can understand it. Like when you, when you look at it like that, it's like, oh, I just pulled something that's, you know, worth $40,000 like that. I can understand why people get into it for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, we could talk about this all day, but I got, I got to ask you one other question. We can always get okay. back to memorabilia. I could talk about forever. So. We already uh, we already spoke about those two walk offs you had, but any other best mo- notable best moments on the field that you want to mention? No, I mean you know I, there's a lot of stuff that runs together. You know when you I played a long time, I was fortunate to play a long time. I think that my first walk off hit against the Cubs when I was a rookie, I was struggling at the plate. You know I just gotten called up and I was still kind of trying to find my way, and I hit a. Uh, a bullet to right center to walk off the Cubs like two weeks into my career against the Cubs when it was really, a, you know, th- that series was a lot bigger than it maybe has been in years past, the last few years. Maybe it's gotten better recently, but it was a big deal then. And that was a really cool moment. It got my average above 200. And then I really had a great rest of the year from there. And then even last year, uh, when I played with the Tigers in 2019, I mean, we were one of the worst teams in history. And like, that was like really tough because I was like the glue guy that needed to keep everybody up, which was kind of tough uh, to deal with that. But we, we faced the Astros in Houston and we were like, they said that we were like the worst odds to win a game in the history of baseball. Verlander was going against, I don't know. I, I, I forget. I think our guy was named Alexander. He's a little stud, but um worst odds ever to win a game and uh in the bottom of the ninth uh I think their catcher and I'm blanking on his name of course um Torinos I think he was going for a cycle instead of hitting stopping at second he tries to go for three and they hit a double you know in the right center gap or whatever and they throw the ball to me and I you know we gun him out at third base and that was like even for like us being so bad that was just one of those moments where it ended on this incredible relay from the outfielder to me at the third base and we got him out. And it was just one of those things that it took me a while to like come down from that. Cause that was just so exciting, you know, the way to, the way that it finished. So there's a million moments like that. I love robbing Derek Jeter of hits because he's kind of my idol. So that was kind of fun. Um, he always wanted to go in the four hole. So I'd always shade over there, but this is before he actually had a card that told you where to, um, you know, stand every time you look down back pocket and stuff so but yeah man I mean there's too many to think about I mean I didn't have a great career but I had a lot of fun and and a lot of guys um you know had a lot of fun with the guys that I was with absolutely robbing Derek Jeter has got to be an amazing moment for sure yeah he got me back but that's but yeah he's he's yeah man Derek Jeter is the best one of the best of all time for sure I'm a Yankee fan, so I, I, I'll, I'll agree with you. Yeah. So uh, before we let you go, I got to ask, you know, who's winning it all in 2021? Man, I think a lot of good teams. I, I'm, I'm excited to see kind of what plays out. I think, you know, I, I don't know why the first team that popped up was the Padres, man. I think that they, you know, with their lineup, uh, it was already good. You know, they, they signed Tatis. He's got security and all that now. And then all of a sudden, uh, he's got plenty of security. Um and then they sign, you know, they <laughs> trade for these arms and they're going to be good, man. I mean, it's going to be tough for anybody to beat the Dodgers, but like, I, I, I like the Padres. I was a part of their, their uh, squad in the spring training last year. And I like what they got going on. So I'm going to say Padres. How about that? That's a, that's not the, the best pick or not the worst odds, but I, I think that they'll be good. I like the a lot of security uh, comment. Yeah, he's got <laughs> he's got plenty of security now. He's secure for a career. If, yeah. if you know, but um, we'll see what happens. Yeah, they they have a great team. But uh, anyway, Gordon, you know, thank you so much for taking time. This has been great, and we'd love to stay in touch, dude. This was awesome. Yeah, we'll do it again. Thanks, guys. No doubt.